Consider a topological space X. In this video, we're going to take a closer look at its fundamental groupoid. First, let us recall what the fundamental groupoid is as an algebraic structure. The space of objects of the fundamental groupoid is X itself. Morphisms are equivalence classes of paths relative to the endpoints. For instance, here we see two points P and Q that belong to X and are therefore objects in Pi 1 of X. Now the animation shows a path that goes from P to Q and therefore represents a morphism from P to Q. Relative homotopies, as shown in the animation, do not change the morphism. Our main result in this video says that the fundamental groupoid is not only a groupoid, it's also a topological space. In fact, we will see that the topology in the fundamental groupoid is naturally defined from the topology of X. And furthermore, if X is sufficiently nice, the fundamental groupoid will be a covering space of the pair groupoid. As a first remark, you should note that the pair groupoid itself is of course a topological space since it is simply the product of X with itself. Before we explain what nice means, let us provide some intuition about the topology of the fundamental groupoid. Whatever topology we put in the fundamental groupoid should match our intuition for what it means for a path to vary in a continuous way. In fact, this is something that we have seen already. Namely, when we think of continuously deforming a path, we always think about the notion of homotopy. It follows that much like a homotopy is a continuous family of paths, if we now take equivalence classes, then we will think that a homotopy is providing for us a continuous family of classes in the fundamental groupoid. You should observe that the interesting homotopies are those that are not relative to the endpoints. The reason is that all the paths in a homotopy relative endpoints represent the same class in the fundamental groupoid, which implies that the homotopy defines a constant family in the fundamental groupoid. In this way, we've defined what it means to move continuously in the fundamental groupoid, and we also see that as we move continuously, our initial point and our final point also move continuously. This means that the map source, comma, target that goes from the fundamental groupoid to x times x is in fact continuous in this way. Let us formalize this intuitive idea of continuity by defining actually a topology. Given the points p and q and the path gamma, we are going to take neighborhoods v and w of p and q respectively. We imagine these neighborhoods as being rather small, so we are just looking at points close to P and Q. The idea is that a path close to gamma looks a lot like gamma, except that its endpoints have moved slightly within V and W. That is, a path close to gamma can be obtained from gamma itself by concatenating at the beginning and at the end with a path containing V and with a path containing W. The key observation behind the theorem is the following. If V is simply connected, there's a unique way up to homotopy of connecting P with the new initial point. This reasoning applies as well in W. From this, it follows that if we move the endpoints slightly, then there's a unique way of moving gamma up to homotopy to follow such endpoints. What we have shown is that as long as X is nice locally, a neighborhood in the fundamental groupoid looks exactly like a neighborhood in X times X. This proves that the fundamental groupoid is a covering space of the pair groupoid. One of the main corollaries of this result is the following. If we fix a base point P in X and we take its source fiber, that is, the classes of paths that begin at P, then we will see, using the target map, that this becomes a covering space of X itself, and in fact, under niceness assumptions, this is the universal cover. We will illustrate these two results in the particular case of S1 in a minute. Before we do that, let us discuss what niceness means a bit more in detail. First of all, you should observe that we must require X to be path-connected. The reason is that in the pair groupoid, 
Every two points are connected by a morphism. This must also be true for the fundamental groupoid if we want the fundamental groupoid to be a covering space. The second assumption is that x should be locally simply connected. This means that given any point p in x and any neighborhood u of p, there must exist a slightly smaller neighborhood v contained in u and contained in p that is simply connected. This is precisely what we required from v and w in our previous argument. It turns out that this assumption can be weakened slightly to something called semi-locally simply connectedness, but I invite you to check the book by Hatcher to see more details. In any case, most of the spaces to be studied in this course will be extremely simple locally. A typical example to keep in mind are manifolds. You may recall that all of them are locally contractible since locally they resemble Rn. For instance, here we see the circle as one and we observe that locally it looks like R. Further examples are the spheres, as shown in the animation, or the torus and all the other surfaces. Moving on from the realm of manifolds, other examples that are also locally contractible are the so-called cell complexes. In dimension one, these are spaces which are assembled by taking vertices and edges, so we call them graphs. And we see that even though they are not necessarily locally Euclidean, they are still locally contractible. Here we see a two-dimensional cell complex that is made out of two spheres and two intervals. And once again, we see a neighborhood that is not Euclidean, but it's contractible nonetheless. To conclude our discussion, let us observe that the Hawaiian earring is not locally simply connected. Indeed, if we look at the point where all the circles meet, we will see that every neighborhood is not simply connected. It follows that the Hawaiian earring cannot have a universal cover. These ideas will become more transparent by looking at the fundamental groupoid of S1. We are going to build it as a topological space, piece by piece. First, we observe that there's a set theoretical inclusion of S1 into its fundamental groupoid. Namely, given any point, we can map it to the corresponding identity. If we take into account the topologies, this is not just an injective map, it is in fact an actual inclusion as a subspace. Furthermore, we observe that this is a general fact, and it's not particular to S1. In the animation, we see S1 on the right, and we depict the identities on the left. On the right, we see the unit complex number 1, and on the left, we see the corresponding class of the constant path at 1. Similarly, we depict the point e to the pi fourths i and its corresponding identity, and the point i and its identity. Let us move on from the identities. Another important subspace of the fundamental groupoid is the source fiber over the point 1. These are the classes of paths whose initial point is 1. Let us recall that these classes are in correspondence with the real numbers. Namely, each class starting at 1 is characterized by how much we turn around this 1, and this is exactly measured by a real number. It turns out that this bijection is in fact a homeomorphism. This allows us to draw the source fiber as a copy of the real line passing through the identity at 1. Furthermore, we see that the target map, that is the map that takes a class to its endpoint, turns the source fiber into a covering space of S1. Since the source fiber is contractible, it follows that it is the universal cover, and in fact, if you look at the formula, you will see that it is the usual formula of R covering S1. As promised, we see that the universal cover is a subspace of the fundamental groupoid. Inside the source fiber, we can in particular find the classes that not only they begin at 1, they also end at 1. These are drawn in the animation as black points, and of course together they form the fundamental group of S1 at 1. To keep things grounded, let us draw some of the paths representing classes in the source fiber. For instance, here we can see paths that make at most one turn 
turning positively. Our convention is that we will draw their source point in red, which in this case it's the point 1, and their target point will be drawn in orange. We can similarly depict paths that turn at most twice positively. And the higher we go in the source fiber, we will encounter loops that turn more and more, but always starting at one. Let us now change the source point. For instance, now we see the source fiber over the point I. Much like before, the black dots represent the fundamental group at the point I. And once again, we can look at representative paths that turn at most one, but now starting at I. Here we see the class of the loop based at I and whose rotation is 2, and the class based at I and whose rotation is 3. A key remark is that the source fiber over I is once again homeomorphic to the real line. And once again, we can use the target map to see that the source fiber over I is the universal cover of S1. Due to the uniqueness of the universal cover up to isomorphism, it follows that both source fibers must be equivalent. And in fact, we see that the isomorphism between the two is given by conjugation. Exactly the same reasoning will tell us that all the source fibers are isomorphic to each other and all of them can be thought of as the universal cover. We can then take all the source fibers together to form the fundamental groupoid and therefore we see that the fundamental groupoid of S1 is homeomorphic to the cylinder. The identification between the two boils down to saying that a class in the fundamental groupoid is characterized by its initial point and how much it turns. Similarly, we see that the fundamental groupoid is a covering space of the pair groupoid, and in this case what this says is that the cylinder is a covering space of the torus. The covering map takes a class which is represented by its initial point and how much it turns, and it simply outputs the initial point and the final point. Another interesting subspace of the fundamental groupoid is the union of all the fundamental groups. In this case, we see that this is a countable collection of copies of S1. One of the path components is the union of all the identities. Each other component consists of all the loops that have a given rotation number. The general statement is that the union of all the fundamental groups will always be a covering space of X. One of its path components is always a copy of X itself, namely the component of the identities. However, in general, the other path components need not be copies of X itself. The other subspaces that are of interest to us are the target fibers, which we now draw in orange. We we'll start with a little piece of the target fiber over one. Namely, this is the piece consisting of those classes of paths that end at 1 and rotate positively at most one turn. As we did before, let us draw explicitly some representative paths. For instance, here we see the path that starts at minus i, it ends at 1, and it makes a quarter of a turn in the middle. Finally, we see the rest of the target fiber over 1, and we see that it spirals around the fundamental groupoid. If we now move the target point, we will see the different target fibers. For instance, here is the target fiber over minus i, here the target fiber over minus 1, now the target fiber over i, and once again the target fiber over 1. As a reality check, observe that if we intersect the target fiber over 1 with the source fiber over 1, we will obtain precisely the fundamental group at 1. To conclude the video, let us check that the topology in the fundamental groupoid behaves exactly as we claimed earlier. On the right, we now depict two copies of S1. The one at the top, in orange, represents the target points, and the one at the bottom, in red, represents the source points. We put the two together as a product representing the pair groupoid. 
what we're going to do is take product opens in S1 times S1, and we're going to look at their pre-image in the fundamental groupoid. We begin with an open V in the source S1, and we see that its pre-image in the fundamental groupoid is a vertical strip. We can similarly consider an open W in the target S1. It follows that its pre-image spirals around the fundamental groupoid. If we put V and W together as a product, we see that V times W is an open in S1 times S1. It is in fact a product open centered at the point minus I minus I. And if we look now at the intersection of the opens in the fundamental groupoid, we see that it is disconnected. There's Z many path components, and each of them looks like a little square, namely it looks like a copy of V times W. This illustrates the fact that the fundamental groupoid is indeed a covering space of the pair groupoid. Let us wrap up this video by stating once more all the main results. First, the fundamental groupoid of X is a covering of X times X as long as X is path connected and locally simply connected. In particular, inside of the fundamental groupoid, we can find a very special subspace, namely the source fiber over our favorite point, and it turns out that this source fiber is the universal cover of X itself. Apart from this source fiber, there's other interesting subspaces of the fundamental groupoid, for instance the target fiber, which is similarly also a copy of the universal cover, as well as the subspace consisting of all the fundamental groups, which is also a covering space of X. Something that we haven't covered in this video, but that I invite you to think about, is the fact that the subspace of composable arrows is also a topological space. Using this topology, you can in fact check that the operations in the fundamental groupoid are in fact continuous. We have already seen that the inclusion of the identities into the fundamental groupoid is a topological inclusion, but you can also check that the product and the inverse are also continuous maps. What this is telling us is that the fundamental groupoid is on the one hand a topological space, and on the other hand it's a groupoid, and in fact these two structures, they behave nicely with respect to each other. We then say that the fundamental groupoid is a so-called topological groupoid. Alright, this is the end of the video, thanks a lot for watching.